Okay, so we're in John chapter 11. Uh, our, the name of this uh, chapter is Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Wow, thank you, Jesus. All right, Mirari, can you read John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16? John 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a me message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No. It happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected, Rabbi, they said only a few days ago the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied. There are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of the world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I will go and wake him up. Amen, amen. So this is a very powerful story. So what did Jesus mean by this sickness will not end with death? He said, this sickness will not end with death. Because like he said, he was asleep. Right. So um, Jesus was basically talking about spiritual death. We know Lazarus died, physically died. But spiritual he didn't die spiritually to be eternally separated from God. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why Jesus said this uh, sickness will not end with death. Um, Jesus said that Lazarus's sickness was for God's glory. What did he mean by that? It was for God's glory. How can sickness be for God's glory? Oh, is every sickness for God's glory? Wow. No, right. So we, we, we ask that question, is every sickness for God's glory? But Jesus said this, um, he, uh, in verse four, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. How was Jesus glorified through Lazarus's sickness? Um, because he's going to bring him back. Amen. And that's it. Amen. He's going to be glorified, right? We're yeah. going to see. We're going to see that. Oh my gosh! Jesus is really the resurrection and the life. He is Lord over death. He can even raise someone back from the dead. So that's what it means. It, he will be glorified. Amen. Is every sickness for God's glory? Everyone who gets sick, is it for God's glory? No. Mm. No, right? No. God, uh -uh. God uses sickness sometimes as punishment and as correction. There are certain sicknesses that don't lead to death, but there are certain sicknesses that lead to death. And so people get sick. God will put sickness on someone and allow them to get sick because they dishonor God. We can look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. If you are constantly dishonoring God and not repenting, God will put sickness and disease on you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, talking up, um, uh, Jesus is talking about the church in Thyatira. And um, Jesus wasn't pleased because they were tolerating the woman Jezebel. Let's start from verse 20. Revelation chapter two, verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet 
By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Wow. And when God puts sickness on you, you can't take it off. No. So the people refuse to repent. The Lord God can put sickness and disease on them. Also, 1 Corinthians, we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's talking about communion, the bread and the wine. And the grape juice, we drink grape juice. Mm -hmm. We got to be careful when we take communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting from verse 27. It reads, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. And so, anytime we take communion, you know, I always say, let us examine ourselves, see if we're holding any unforgiveness. If we know we're doing some sinning, do not take communion. If you are rebellious against God, do not take communion. Because you can get sick or even die. That's how serious. I don't think a lot of people realize that. I know. And still take communion. Yeah. You make sure that you're right with God. You make sure that you're right with God. Always, you know, sometimes we have fight with our loved ones. Oh, you got to forgive that person before you take communion. And so, um, and as we said, sometimes sickness is for the glory of God, just like the man who was born blind and for Lazarus, right? Now, um, sometimes unconfessed sin, just like, you know, with Jezebel here, King Nebuchadnezzar, God made him mentally ill. Because God warned him a year before, you need to repent and acknowledge that I'm the king of kings and the lord of lords. A year later, what is he doing? He's up on the top of his palace walking around. Look what I did and look what I did. And the scripture says, God took his mind. He was mm -hmm. for seven years, right? He was in the field like a madman. And God restored him after the seven years, but he was punished. And we know. We can get sick because of unhealthy living. We're not exercising. You know, we're eating too much junk food. <laughs> you know, we're the ones to blame. Don't blame God there. <laughs> um, God can bring uh, sickness for uh, salvation purposes again, just for the light, the glory of God. And there is a sickness that leads on to death. That's when God want to punish you. In Second Chronicles chapter 21, there was this king there. He was a bad king. He killed off his siblings. He was just bad. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 21. 21? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can start from verse 1. Second Chronicles 21. It says, then Jehoshaphat rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariah, who, Michael, and Sheptiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was his firstborn son. 
When Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials of Israel. He killed off all his brothers. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. Ahab was a wicked king, but he married a daughter of Ahab. Ahab was the one who married Jezebel. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. In the time of Jehoram, Edom rebelled against Judah and set up its own king. So Jehoram went there with his officers and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he rose up and broke through by the night. Da, 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 da. Drop down where? Well. Drop down to verse 16. The Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. They attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace. Verse 18. After all this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. Wow. In the course of time, at the end of the second year, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great pain. Who inflicted him? Wow. And so, you know, we need the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of the Lord because God can inflict diseases and sickness as punishment. Just like the plagues, right? Plagues. So we got to be careful. All right. Oh my so, gosh, yes. Yeah. So let's uh, back to this. Um, for example, right? Um, well, Job's sickness was for God's glory. But why did God allow sickness and disease to come upon Job? Why did God allow so much suffering to come upon Job? Was Job bad? What did Job do? I don't think he was bad. Um, I, I do remember with his story that Satan was allowed to test him. Exactly. Remember, Satan came and said, Job is only serving you because of what he can get from you. He's only serving you because you have blessed him. He's only serving you because you protect him. You, you lift up your hands off of him and he will curse you. And God said, okay. Okay. And God will I allow bet you he won't. <laughs> yes. God will allow us to be tested. But God <laughs> knew Job's heart. I mean, even his... Wife came and said, why don't you curse God and die? Right? And Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, you know, when it's just like how sometimes we're going through a test. Job didn't know what was happening in the background, what was happening in the spirit world. But well, he's remained faithful to God. Sometimes God allows us to be tested too. All right. What trial or tribulation has God allowed in the past or you are currently going through, which is for God's glory, so that Jesus may be glorified through it? That can be personal. You know, you don't have to share, but, you know, all of us are going through uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Just for your personal thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. I think we've all been through our trials and tribulations. <laughs> um and we've made it through, right, Dion? Exactly. And we were thinking like, God, what's happening here? You have a bad vision. But he never did. He never did. He was, he was growing us up. <laughs> All right, back to this. Have you ever felt like Jesus is staying two more days while the trial you are in seems dire and Jesus is delaying coming to your aid? Because, you know, um, the sister sent word and said, Listen, Jesus, the one you love, he's sick. Come quickly. And Jesus is like, no, we're going to spend two more days. <laughs> like, Jesus, hello. <laughs> so sometimes we feel like we're in the trial. Where are you, Jesus? Sometimes we feel like Jesus is staying two more days. While the, while we, the you know, the storm is raging. We're like, Jesus, where are you? Are you going to, 
Where did the, the um, disciples in the boat? Jesus, are you going to let us drown? You're here sleeping. Don't you see what's happening? Water coming into the boat. And you're here with us, not doing anything over there sleeping. Sometimes that's how we feel, right? You got that right. <laughs> but this is where Jesus is training us up and killing our flesh and taking us, teaching us how to trust in him and how to have faith. Amen. Okay. Was Jesus afraid to return to Judea? No. He had a plan. He had a plan. And, you know, it, he was there. That's where the um, Pharisees, you know, they wanted to kill him because he had healed the man born blind and they accused him of blasphemy. So remember, he had left that area and went to Galilee. So, you know, Thomas is like, oh my God. I don't know why is he going back there. I'm just going to surrender. I'm just going to die with him. <laughs> you know, we're going to read that in the next one. Yeah. Um, did you read? You're right up to 16, right? Yeah. yeah. A, yes. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So in verse 16, Thomas is like, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Where's so your faith? Dramatic. <laughs> no, he has no faith. You know, it was the same Thomas. Like us at many times, you know, after Jesus was resurrected and uh, he had appeared to many of the disciples except Thomas. And Thomas was like, well, I ain't going to believe it until he comes and show me his hands where he was uh, nailed. And they were in the room and Jesus appeared. He didn't open the door. He just appeared in the room and he said, Thomas, here, here's the hole in my hands. <laughs> this is what you asked for as proof that I'm alive. Yeah, so we always call him Doubting Thomas, but that's how, that's how we are sometimes. Gotta, gotta see it to believe it. <laughs> Funny, Doubting Thomas, yeah. <laughs> he was the uh, dramatic one. Oh, let yes. us just go and that we may die with him. Oh my God, oh my goodness. Thomas, all right, right. So because Jesus wasn't afraid to go to Judea, how does this show Jesus's commitment and love for Lazarus and for us? He loves us. He cares about us. He's, he's not going to waver for anyone. He's not going to listen to anyone because they feel like they're going to die. He's, he, he knows what he's doing. He has a plan and he's pushing forward. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And he wasn't going to let those wicked Pharisees stop him from going and bring glory and honor to his dad and uh, for him to raise Lazarus from the dead and to comfort his, uh, their sister and to teach us that he is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Okay, next, next question. How did Jesus know that Lazarus had died? How did he know? How did Jesus know that Lazarus had died? Because he's Jesus. Amen. He is God. He does yeah. everything. Exactly. Good. <laughs> okay. What lesson did Jesus want to teach the disciples when he said, for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Wait, Jesus said that? Yes. So after he told them that Lazarus had died, he said, for your sake, talking to his disciples, I'm glad that I was not there. Because Jesus is saying, if I was there, I would have healed him. He would have healed him right then and there. But now right. he's going to be dead two days and people are going to be like, oh, exactly. he raised him from the dead. Right, amen. And this is, this is a type of a shadow that, remember, Jesus was telling the disciples all the time. I think over three times it's in the scriptures. Listen, guys, I have to go to Jerusalem and die. But on the third day, I will be raised up. But you know, they weren't paying attention just like us many times. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was trying to show them, I am the Lord over death. So when you see me dead, you should, you should be um, worrying because I've told you that I'm the, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm going to come back to life again. He was trying to teach them all these things, but they weren't paying attention. Amen. And what does Jesus also want to teach us? Trust him, have faith in him, that he can do anything. 
all things. Amen. Amen. All right, let's move on. John chapter 11, 17 through 37. Oh, I'll help you read. This is a big one. All right, so read to verse uh, 30. Mm -hmm. Read uh, up to 30? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus the Nazareth was simply sleeping, but Jesus the Nazareth had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles on the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, mother said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection, the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. Okay, yes. Verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. By the way, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? You always have the cynical people, right? So... <laughs> How is Jesus the resurrection and the life? And do you believe it? Yes, I do. He is the light. Mm -hmm. I do believe it. He is the light. Mm -hmm. And he is the resurrection and the life. He is the author of life. Wherever Jesus is, nothing can stay dead. All dominion, power, and authority belongs to him. He is God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is the one who breathed the breath of life into his disciples in John chapter 20. He is the resurrection and the life. And so we don't have to worry, you know, of death. We don't have to worry about death because Jesus right. is here. Right. He said, anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. When we, we have cr already crossed over from death to life, we have, the minute we receive Jesus, we have crossed over from death to life. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? We are, we are no longer under God's wrath. <clears throat> so we will not be eternally separated from God. Mm -hmm. We go to be with the Lord Jesus. So that is how Jesus is the, 
resurrection and the life. We see that Jesus was deeply moved, even though he knew he was going to resurrect Lazarus. He was still moved by their grief. What does this show us about Jesus? He cares. He cries with us. Amen. Amen. He was fully man and fully God. He's also moved by our grief and pain. You know, when we're going through a tough time, he comes and he comforts us. And he comes and he tells us it's going to be okay. Daddy's in the house and everything's going to be okay. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is with the brokenhearted. He knows what grief feels like. If you have lost a loved one, you know, I was just listening to the news. We had another school shooting. <clears throat> We're just in the beginning of the school year. And we had a school shooting in Georgia. Four people died. Two teachers and two students. There's a lot of grief going on right now. You that, know, that happened now? Yeah, today. In oh, I didn't know that. Yes. You know, if you really want to hurt someone, is take their children away from them. Ah, oh, that's sad. We thank God that, you know, Jesus can heal us of the pain, the emotional pain, and the grief, and restore us, resurrect us again. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He can resurrect us after we've been beaten down and abused and he can resurrect us and give us new life he is the resurrection and the life how do we question god's love for us and others just like the jews in verse 37 they were well, we like got him. Well, hmm? we got him. yeah could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying yeah that's what I it's unbelief that there's doubt. Yes, yes. It's so, so sometimes like God, you know, couldn't you have done something? Sometimes God literally waits till it's dead. Because we have to come to the end of ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we have to come to the end of ourselves for him to resurrect us. You remember the time when we were at your house and we were studying this? And I forgot who read, Lazarus come forth. And your husband came into the kitchen, came, came into the living room. I remember. Yes, we were at your house. <laughs> I don't remember. We were with them. Um, <laughs> what's her name? Oh my goodness. She, she, she's down. Oh, Lisa? Lillian. Oh, Lillian. Lillian. Yes. Lillian. Ask her. Sure. Yes. <laughs> So, so many great things have happened. <laughs> Some that we cannot even explain the right way without, you know, people going, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Because it is. It's God. Yes. He came, he came into the living room and said, you guys called me. I was like, no, I didn't call you. But God was calling him. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um. Uh, so God is teaching us about his sovereignty. And um, that's what he wanted to teach these people. And that's what he wants to teach us many times, you know, when we feel like, you know, Jesus, you're taking so long. This thing is going to die. You know, you know, I remember when I was coming down here, I was trying to buy a house and the deal fell through. I'm like, God, uh, you know, what am I going to do? I don't want the place to stay but he found some place for me to stay it wasn't his will then to to get a house but well, you know we're trying to do things before god and so if the deal is dying god don't you see if you had moved it wouldn't have died that's how we feel sometimes right but god is doing something else and we have our own plans we have our own agendas we gotta line up our agenda with god's we got to line up our own agenda, Scott, because he is sovereign. Um, let's look at Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Okay, it reads, God speaking. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is saying, listen, I don't think like you. I don't do things the way how human beings do things. My ways and my thoughts are higher. You have to be the one to elevate your thinking to mine. You have to be the one to align your ways and your thoughts to mine. Because I am not going to come down to your level for you to wallow in sin and for you to do your own thing. I am God. He is sovereign. He is sovereign. Um, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 32. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 32, it reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. I'm not going to read any further. Oh, yeah, I should, I should read. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So God is showing us his sovereignty. When we see things not working out according to our plans, according to our ways, we have to look and say, my God, God, you're doing something. You're sovereign. You're working this out for my good. You're working this out for your glory. And we shouldn't doubt that God loves us because, listen, God, you have proved your love for me by dying on the cross. So if this thing that I'm that I really want isn't working out, you have something better for me. Because I can't deny that you love me and I can't deny that you know where I am. You have a plan. Amen. And then Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of the law. So God doesn't reveal everything to us. He is sovereign. But we got to trust him. Trust in his goodness. Trust in his love. Trust in his mercy. Trust that he is the resurrection and the life. Trust him if we're in a situation and we see we've been, I've, we've all known people who got sick. And the whole church is praying for them and they still die. It's not that God didn't love them or didn't, but they got the ultimate healing. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. And so God knows how to work things out for our good. It might not be what we want, but it is for our good because he is sovereign. How does this explain God's timing versus ours? <laughs> this is better than ours. It, it just is. <laughs> yeah. Is this better? Yes. You know, there's a song that says, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time. In his time. In his he time. does when we try to interfere what happened. Oh, we get knocked down a couple of times. <laughs> yes, the waiting can be painful. I tell you, it is. It is, and it you is. do a lot of praying, a lot of fasting, a lot of crying, but in the end, His glory. Amen. Amen. And in in that process, He's killing us, killing yes. us. Cried. <laughs> that is the best way to describe it. That's how you feel. <laughs> Like the man said, we're going to die. Yes. <laughs> I, said, I said, oh my God. Let's just He's kidding us. Yeah, the flesh. The flesh, our feelings. Our feelings really will consume us and really make us think things that we shouldn't and do things that we shouldn't. And then 
you know, in the end, when you continue to push forward and let God do what he has to do, because his plans are better than ours, in the end, it is the best thing you Amen. could ever do. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22, B says, at the right time, I, God, will make it happen at the right time. Amen. At the right time. Amen. All right, let's move on to John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. John, we're back to the gospel of John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. You want me to read it or you got it? No, if you can read it for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. The Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor, but he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the great clothes and let him go. Amen. Amen. In the King James Version, it says, take off the grave clothes and loose him, loose him, loose him from the bondage of death. So after Lazarus was resurrected, he was still bound in his death clothes when he walked out of his tomb. What old habits and ungodly beliefs did Jesus deliver you from? It's personal. Because we know even after we have been born again, there are still ungodly thinking patterns or strongholds that need to be broken off of our minds. Let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. And it's an ongoing process as we renew our minds with God's word. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 20 through uh, 24 reads, That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude or the renewing of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so we get born again, but God starts to unwrap the death clothes around us, the ungodly thinking of fear, doubt, unbelief, the, uh, you know, the things that we love to rule, you know, our own lives. We have our own agendas. We think things should go this way. Some of us have anger that he has to <laughs> unwrap from us. Some of us has fear, doubt, unbelief, you know, he starts unwrapping these dead thinking, these dead things off of us. And it's a process. It is a process. Amen. All right. What is the conditional requirement for one to never die spiritually? Uh, it says, see verses 25 and 26. It says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? So what is the conditional requirement for one to never die spiritually? To believe in him. Amen. You got to believe. You got to believe. You have to believe. Yeah. You got to believe. 
can Jesus be trusted? Of course. Yes. Amen. Amen. And what in your life needs to be resurrected and restored by Jesus? Can he do it? And do you think he wants to? There are many things in my life as a human being that need to be restored and resurrected. You know, and, and I do, I believe that he can help us. Amen. But we have to be willing and let him don't interfere. Amen. Don't interfere and <laughs> believe, believe, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the word God gave me for this year is Revelation 21, verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Amen. What is that again? I need to write that. Yeah, Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 and uh, five and 6. Then he okay. said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Thank you, Jesus. He's making everything new. He's resurrecting us. There's a song that says, the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Right? Because God knows. We go through tough times. Sometimes we, we you know, we have our gifting and callings lying dormant, not being used. Sometimes we forget what God told us. Sometimes we can get so off, off the right track. We've gone down the wrong road. You know, God has to take us back on the right path. Sometimes we go through battles. We get beaten up. We get the dry bones. Mm -hmm. Come on. We got to be, be, be honest. Some of us go through grief. Life can get hard. And Jesus has to come and revive us. God has periods of revival. God has to have periods of revival for his church. Because he knows we get beaten up. Remember, all of the ten virgins fell asleep. And not, it wasn't just the five foolish ones. The, the, all of us, all of the ten virgins fell asleep. But we thank God that God is working on our behalf. All right. Our last uh, set of questions. John chapter 11, verses 45 through 55. And I'll, uh, I'll read 45 through 50. Okay, it says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. I'll keep on going around. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Okay, so how did the Jews respond to Lazarus's resurrection? 
surprised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And verse 45. Oh, and they want to tell the Pharisees as well. Yes. So many of them, they believed upon Jesus. When they saw Jesus resurrected Lazarus, they said, oh my gosh, he is the Messiah. And they believed upon him. And then you had some, they ran, the little tattletailers ran and told. <laughs> <laughs> right? A so sneaky found, little man. <laughs> exactly. They were working for, for the Pharisees. So their hearts weren't good. Because you see an actual miracle in front of you. And instead of you saying, oh my God, he is the Messiah, you run and go tell the Pharisees. You're in, you know, Kahoot with the Pharisees. Oh my goodness. It, it's no matter what they see, there's always one that's going to believe and there's always one that's not. There, there is. Why were the Pharisees, okay. What happens when Jesus resurrects us and the dead situations in our lives? What happens? I know for me, I'm excited and thankful to the Lord. Exactly. We're happy, right? And yeah. but then, you know, just like this, is not everybody going to be happy for us? <laughs> no. Envy and jealousy comes in. Exactly. There are people who don't know what you had to go through to get this blessing. You don't know what died in my life. You don't know how Jesus had to come and resurrect things in my life. But now you see me with a blessing and you're not happy for me. And so not everyone is going to be happy. In, you know, in, in, in John chapter 12, verse 10 to 11, it tells us that the Pharisees, they wanted to kill Lazarus. <laughs> want to kill him again uh john it's chapter 12 like if it was his fault i know but why why did they wanna why did they wanna kill him it says let me read it john 12 10 through 11 so the chief priest made plans to kill lazarus as well for on account of him many of the jews were going over to jesus and putting their faith in him wow right so why did they want to kill lazarus again Wow, because he was proof of Jesus. Exactly. That was it. Exactly. Now, do you see what happens when God resurrects us? The devil want to kill us too? Mm -hmm. Because we're the living proof that Jesus is alive. We are the living proof that he is the Messiah, that he is the savior of the world. So that's why when you're, you get saved, you come to Christ, Ooh, things are sweet, and then life starts getting hard. You're like, oh my God, what's going on here? <laughs> because we are the living poor. Some people have, the enemy have literally tried to take out. Mm -hmm. But we thank God Jesus is the resurrection and the life. They wanted to kill Lazarus again. You see what evil is? Your evil. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump to this one and finish up. Why did Jesus have to withdraw from his own people? And how do we sometimes have to withdraw from our own people? Their negativity. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Jesus knew that they wanted to kill him. So he had to withdraw. Sometimes we got to withdraw from our own people to protect and to live. For us to move forward with Christ. Jesus', Jesus, is, life, mm -hmm. Jesus is life is our life. We got to realize we're going to live the same life that he lived. When we we're going through things and we're like, oh my God, what is going on? Look back and say, oh my God. Jesus' life is my life. I'm living Jesus' life. That's why, um, is it Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Yes. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. So we are living Christ's life. Mm. Why we get persecuted? You know, that's why we come under attacks. We're living Jesus' life. We are the living proof that Jesus is alive. That's why we're persecuted. Yes. Because they want to shut us up. You know? They want to. Yeah, you're right. They are the living proof um, because we're believers. Exactly. Christ lives inside of us. We are the witnesses that Jesus is alive. He is the resurrection. But we don't have nothing to fear. We don't have to fear because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus says, fear not those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. But we're to fear the one who can put both body and soul in hell, which is the father. The devil, if God allows him to kill us, we don't have to worry because we know we're going with Jesus. He cannot kill our souls. That's why we don't have to fear. That's why Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That's why God says we're not going to die. And John chapter 8, verse 51, and this is the final scripture. John 8, 51 says, very truly, I tell you, Jesus speaking, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Whoever obeys my word will never see death. So we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear that we will be separated from God. Because we have already crossed over from death to life. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, that concludes mm -hmm. our study. Mm -hmm.